Good day, everyone. This is the uh, Beehive bi-weekly at this point. Bi-weekly calls. We have um, uh, Alejandro, uh, Hettinger, John, Jan, Patrick, Mark, and myself, Antronik. Uh, did I miss anyone? I hope not. Looks like that not. Okay, great. Um, Michael might have a difficulty attending. Um, he's currently stuck in uh, traffic, trying to find a parking lot. And uh, I am very much not very active in the Beehive call. So if anyone wants to take over, please uh, take it away. But if needed, I can read and write in the document. Thank you. So um, John brought a topic. Shall we start with that? Got a place to sit Go for it. Do you want to talk about the problem you have to solve? Oh, one feedback on? So the, here I see it says a topic idea from John. Is that what we're talking about or is there anything else? That's the topic I... Uh wanted to bring up. Okay, so a uh, document dynamic network configuration on FreeBSD. Uh, my host has been up for months, but I just handed this new VLAN that needs to be used on a project. RC conf is nice and all, but a dozen guests could come and go between reboots. Variation of this theme, Michael D and um, uh, Michael D and read only treat lightly systems with the goal of changes vanishing on reboot please incubate documentation for the wiki and or the handbook uh yep alejandro yes so um, sorry i i wanted to add also another topic uh regarding clock sources or time counters on on beehive guests especially ubuntu Thank you. So beehive Just sources? Clock sources for beehive guests. Yeah. Uh, Just start a new uh, section in the document after we're gone. Um, is the John WD uh, who brought the topic the same as the John D who joined? We, we had a similar topic uh, like two weeks ago. And Mm -hmm. And maybe like the previous meetings. Uh, so Sean, which is my colleague, he's the one that started um, on that issue probably two two meetings ago. Mm -hmm. So you might find the, the links to the, the forum posts. Oh, so there is on Sean. Um, so so there's um, a few box sources. I don't know if you, we can talk about it later. I don't know if, if it is my time or someone else's time. So I'm, I'm in no rush. I can wait. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I said in the previous, so in the previous meeting notes uh, about the uh, clock sources uh, for Linux systems. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, I will uh, mention that there. Thank you. So we have a comment from Jan, which is you can declare your intent in rc.conf and use commands like service native clone up name and service native, I'm guessing start, right? Start name to start to re reconfigure only the parts you want to change okay and just to confirm so, john d is the same as john wd i don't know uh, john d didn't reply and his microphone is off i don't know if he's even oh right him. he went for really his active water. right now okay. or if he stepped away for a minute i don't know okay but that's a good but, comment uh, thank you john what you can do in freebsd uh, because the net if and routing and so on scripts are tightly interrounded if you use the routing script you get into trouble if you just restart the net IF, the static routes are missing. So for example, you SSH into your remote server with a static 
routing and address configuration just run service net IF restart on an inter uh, on all interfaces and while your interfaces will come back up um, because it's handled by a different service the routing service uh, your default route will not be recreated and you lock yourself out out unless you can jump through a host on the same uh, link. So um, yeah, if you lack a proper out of band management access to recover, these kinds of things are dicey. And the existing RC.D scripts aren't really the a proper solution. They kind of work and they can bring it up and you can most of the time modify them using sysrc, the rc.conf configuration, then apply only the changes you want. But for that to work, you have to really know how the rc.d oh. scripts work under the hood so that you can basically either stop the current conf parts of the configuration you want to get rid of and then remove them or in the other way, add them first and then only rerun the parts you want to rerun. And yeah, instead in my so, so, um, production systems, I prefer to sidestep the issue and don't use the rc.d system, but use s6rc or run it or other process supervisors and service managers, which are available at as ports. Uh, but then you have to do it yourself. But you, in return, you are in full control and S6RC is a lot more rigid and correct to a fault so that you don't shoot yourself in the foot. But the downside of that is that it is annoying to get up and running if you're not already familiar with how it works. And uh, Jan, uh, I wanted to ask, um, uh, the clone up is part of the start, right? Like you don't have to do clone up specifically. Uh, I'm not start. sure if it's written with an underscore. I think it's written as one word. Okay. Like this. Let me check. Uh, yes, it is. But uh, if you only want to clone one specific interface, mm -hmm. Because you would have, let's say you have, want to have a new VLAN interface, so you add it to the cloned interfaces list. But you want to have the VLAN 10 or something, or 27. Okay. And there are also commands such, such as VNet up and VNet down, which I, I don't know actually what that is for. I've never... Um, VNet yeah. up and down. Let me check. VNet up and down should be... VNet up and down should um, be started by the jail framework. No, this is net IF common EFN setup. What is EFN VNet setup? Um, it's, let me read it in etc. RC dot, uh, no, it's Net in network dot sub. Network dot sub. Oh, uh, okay. It just does the usual EFN, but it also uh, puts it into a VNet. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's a support function to move an interface into a specific VLAN so that you would create it on the parent and then oh, it is already auto discovered because it's a physical interface or something. Well, just then, a VLAN or a VNet? VNet. Okay. So it just handles moving the interface to a VNet. Okay. Great. Great. Uh, well, let's wait for John D until he comes back uh, so we can discuss this idea of his. Uh, maybe until he does come back. Jan, anything else or anyone else wants to add anything for this specific problem? So John, he yes. might even... Yep, go on. Jan, are you aware? Are you aware of any work that is being done in terms of uh, getting to a more dynamic environment? I mean, let's not uh, uh, evoke the the system D 
curse um, here, but I, I well remember Jordan Hubbard uh, calling for launch D or similar integration in 2004 in his in, keynote at Karlsruhe already. So, so uh, something like this that is not system D is definitely so called. The thing is that, yes, system D left a barren wasteland behind. Yeah, so no, let's, not talk, let's not talk system D. Are there but, uh, no, 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 I don't want to talk about what it is. I want to acknowledge the problem that there is a lot of res basically resignation and frustration just for tackling the problem of single host service management at all. You have a lot of work going to things like Nomad or Kubernetes to do it mm -hmm. in clusters, but the local service management is just, um, yeah, barren wasteland. Nobody wants to touch and we build. Yeah, and I, I think, well. think the existing RC.D scripts will not carry us forward. Because it's everything that's wrong with shell scripting. It's massive. It's hard to debug. It's unauditable. It's just stringly typed. And it's my impression that a lot of people are yeah. afraid to touch it because they expect it to break. And the more dynamic you become, the more you need a real programming language to at least build the tools you can then assemble into your system configuration. Um, I think in 2018 also, I gave a talk about uh, using S6RC as init system for FreeBSD at your BSDCon. And that still works. I do maintain the port. I run it myself, but it's the problem is that you would have to rewrite all rc.d scripts, including the ones in parts, which is not feasible for a single person. And even the the author of uh, S6RC acknowledges that it lacks a user compatible front end. Basically, it's machine, the back end is there, the mechanism is there, but it's not really ready for human consumption. It's just a bit. The hard parts, technically, I don't know. The hard part is a good UI and UX for it on the command line. Right now, what's there is good enough to target with something like Ansible and has been reliable for years for me, but uh, the development of a front end kind of stalled. So, okay. And uh, you're not aware if anyone is working on Launch D, for example, at the moment? No, and I don't think Launch D would be suitable. Why not? Launch D um, is built around the assumption that everything is totally integrated with it, even other than System D. So, for example, there are no dependencies because every service is supposed to be activated by launch D. So if you have, mm -hmm. let's say your normal web stack with a web server, a fast CGI server and a database. In a launch D kind of setup, all daemons would register as services. Launch D would bind the sockets for them and then on first connection would inherit the oh, bound okay. socket and the first connection to the demon and the demon would have to know about it and everything is always ready so there is no dependency to resolve because it's done implicitly at runtime mm -hmm. which has advantages for a desktop system where you want to have lots of heavyweight services available should someone use them uh, but it only works if everything is adopted to this workload. As soon as you have one legacy service, it becomes cumbersome and problematic, unless you can use it like um, bloated INET. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I get but, it. Of course. And I mean, they it's, even it's, go it's, one step further. They have the idea of adding the concept of a transaction. And if a service mm -hmm. is outside of a transaction, LaunchD can actually stop your database because it hasn't been used in a while and takes up a lot of memory. So it will ask the daemon to return the socket to LaunchD so that the service stays ready, but the, the actual process just quits completely and is stopped. But the service mm -hmm. is always ready should someone reconnect, which again, for a mobile system or something like that, or an appliance where you control everything, that makes kind of sense. But again, it's everything at runtime and dynamic. You yeah. don't know if your configuration has broken corner cases and un and other things, the bugs you can still have. Um, for example, because you have two services and they each dip during startup depend on each other and will deadlock if you try to access one. The other has to have the first one already up and available. And if they dynamically start each other, they deadlock at one time. You won't know that you have such a bug at your dependencies in uh, LaunchD until you try. Something mm. more static like a 6 rc requires you to specify the dependencies using only forward dependencies and acknowledge them on the other side of the dependency. And then you ha compile your service definitions into a read-only representation, mostly still text. But you, for example, you can't have a dependency loop anymore because that's a compile time error. But the downside is that it's just annoying to maintain. And I think we need something of a middle ground mm -hmm. which you can incrementally move to and yeah also if i might be wrong but if i remember correctly that was in the talk of looking forward to another 10 years by jordan hubbard which one of the interesting things because he was working on launch at apple is that launch is good for like mobile devices like laptops, right? I don't think that LaunchD is a good idea for servers. It's for dynamic systems. And yeah. so if it's if dynamic behavior is more important to you, and it's still only dynamic in the sense that it dynamically starts things as you use them, but for example, it wouldn't help you with um directly with something like adding a VLAN. Instead, the network configuration becomes an other service, which has similar to what this uh, cursed network manager, where it basically then runs as a service and is targeted through another API. And then you would basically request via an API from the daemon this functionality. And yeah, it becomes complicated. But yeah. okay, sounds good. Um, so it's probably a good idea to look at what's happening around uh, with the cluster focused server tooling. Uh, basically, can we build the local part of such a system so that it's easily targetable on the command line and as API and still works locally? What would you have available to target in your Nomad driver for FreeBSD? But that's just my personal opinion and kind of off topic for this call. Okay, sounds good. Um, uh, Alejandro, you had thoughts on the uh, and does anyone want anyone want to add anything else? Because I don't think that John D is back yet to talk about his issue and if we have mm -hmm. answered his. Oh, issue. I'm back. I've been listening. Okay, good. So Did these you, are the what's ideas. What's that, that your we topic got in here. or? Well, yeah, was this your topic, John WD? 
Yes, that was my topic. Okay. And, you know, I, my perspective is, you know, imagine I have, you know, well over 100 hypervisors out there, and okay. I'm expected to add a VLAN, for instance, to one of them. And if, this is all done in an HA manner, so I've got that VLAN coming in over two separate NICs. I have to lag it together. I then have to take that lag, and I have to uh, tap Put a uh, the, the VLAN off of it to then plug it into a bridge. And then I can use that bridge to plug into the various um, uh, virtual machines. Or I have to take that incoming VLAN and I have to generate an, a new uh, a VF. And then I pass the pair of VFs into a virtual machine that does its own lagging. Um, this all gets highly complicated really quickly. And I am sim all I am trying to say is that the documentation we have on networking is not very good. I have spent m a lot of time inside network.subber and related code trying to figure out how to make things work and make sure they work right. So my recommendation would be to use the link aggregate driver as at the lowest level. So you take your two physical interfaces, aggregate them, then you put the bridge on top and then you put the VLANs on top of a bridge. Because the bridge driver by default will speak spanning tree and you're not supposed to speak spanning tree inside of VLAN tech frames. Here be dragons. I don't disagree. Jan, Jan uh, until recently you could not make uh, VLAN on top of a bridge interface. I know there is something in the works to make that possible and make the bridge interface VLAN aware, but I'm not quite sure how far this has got up until now. Uh, I the think canonical, it, you the, can the, have canonic, VLAN... the canonical way is to put for each VLAN that you want to have a VLAN interface on top of your leg and create a separate bridge for each VLAN and then connect your jails or VMs to each of these separate bridges depending on which VLAN they should belong to. I this agree. Is, this is how everybody runs this stuff in production. That is the only reliable way I have been able to get it to work. Yes, yes, that, that's the documented and perfectly stable way. And I, I run it with about 100 hosts and about 1,000 jails. Yeah, and I've seen a similar situation where having a rapid spanning tree on VLAN tech uh, bridges broke the switches they were attached to. Apologies, so the correct, the the correct way... Just incompatible insane interpretation of what it means to have a, a spanning tree BPDU uh, frame inside a VLAN okay. tag. Okay. Yeah. So the networking group typically has BDU guard enabled. So once that packet goes out, the port gets shut down, and then your networking disappears. And apologies. Just to document, lucky so if you have lag attached to a bridge, the correct way is to create VLANs on the... the lag. On okay, the lag. So, okay, so it is to create a, a lag uh, and then, and then create a, uh, a VLAN on top of the lag. And then right, so you make, 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 that, make yeah. that and VLANs because the point is to have multiple of them, otherwise it's pretty <laughs> easy. Then create some VLANs on top of the leg, and then individual bridges for each of the VLANs. And then, yeah. Okay. So... Sounds like you're in good hands. Have a great meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Michael. Michael. Any questions for me? Yeah. OmniOS is in a lot better place where with uh, the pervasive awesome. use of crossbow. Mm -hmm. uh, in FreeBSD, you always have to assemble the pseudo drivers yourself. Uh, yeah. So, Having this kind of... And it would be nice if you... we were Just for the next five years, let's say, we can get to a point where you have always the namespacing and so on there that you could have the nice things of crossbow and then you only pay the overhead in CPU cycles if you actually have the non-trivial case. So that 
basically you don't have to retroactively add a bridge. The kernel will do it transparently as soon as you add new ports to the bridge. It will do the right thing or maybe even offload it to an ASIC if you can. But that's, yeah. Not where we are. Yeah, yeah that's, what, that, that's what IX Systems is trying to do with uh, TrueNAS and, and they failed, unfortunately. So they, they're magically creating bridges as no. needed in a very intransparent manner and frequently people uh join the forum complaining that uh, they accidentally brought down their network by creating a bridge between two physical ports or, or two VLANs and creating loops um, and everything. So that's not what I meant. Uh, what they did uh, is to they, they just they just try to automate the current system. We need it we need a better system. I'm perfectly exactly. on board what with we need you. is a better system call level interface. So yeah. I just wanted to add uh, in case, uh, John, in case you have, in case this might help you or not, because now it becomes easier than managing an RC conf, which is there's a file in uh, FreeBSD called etc start underscore if dot oh. the interface name, which you can put whatever you want inside of it. And whatever is put inside of it will be executed when the interface uh, gets created. Basically, mm -hmm. um, no. When it started by NetF. When it started by by NetF. Sorry, yeah. When it started by NetF, and I use this in Jailer, so I can uh, hard code a MAC address, for example, inside a yeah. uh, uh, inside a VNet jail. Uh, but... Maybe I don't. I don't know, but it might help you to make the management easier. It might not. You... But but in case you need anything with that, uh, you can have... also use the uh, create arcs uh, in rc.conf to accomplish the same. So you don't have to uh, call out to oh. arbitrary shell scripts. Create arcs, uh, what's it called? ePair. Uh, zero. Yeah. So, um, Jan, um, I have one idea yep. that I just wanted to mention, although I cannot promise anything uh, quite yet. Mm -hmm. I will be attending EuroBSDCon this year. I'm very much looking forward to meeting as many of you guys as you can make mm -hmm. it uh, in Coimbra. I'm also registered for the FreeBSD Developer Summit and not being a kernel hacker, I'm pondering this idea because the handbook section on bridging also, come on, it it's sucks. Hard excuse my French, um, of trying to prepare a FreeBSD advanced networking guide. So we can at least in a concise manner start to document how things are done today with the VLANs on top of the lag and bridges on top of the VLANs, etc. All those knobs that, that even I do not know about, all of them, I agree. I, I did not know the args thing, Jan. Thank you very much. On the other Man, hand, we, conf. Al we, we already discovered that there is a VLANs underscore interface name parameter in rc.conf. Yes. So we, you can automate. You don't need to use cloned interfaces to create VLANs. Exactly. You just enumerate them and whoopee, you get a leg 0 0.7, leg 0 0.8, leg 0 0.9. Exactly. Nice naming. Just brilliant. And documentation on this, I mean, user-readable documentation apart from the man pages uh, or a guide is non-existent. So uh, what I would really like to do during the developer summit is work on documentation in this area. Also, the uh, there is a bridging specific rc.d script to handle auto-bridged interfaces. For dynamically cloned interfaces, you can list them using shell globs so that they get automatically added to a bridge as soon as they're either hot plugged, cloned, mm -hmm. or otherwise appear uh, via the um, DevD based. So DevD sends an event. <coughs> oh, De the kernel yeah. sends a DevCTL message to DevD. DevD is default configuration will invoke uh, the uh, what is it? Ether card rc.d script because that's the first time it appeared, and that in turn will call into the netif uh, rc.d service. Mm -hmm. And that way, through a bit of interaction, you can have 
interfaces with certain naming patterns be automatically added to a specific bridge. Great stuff. So how do we get people to know? Okay, so let's, let's write um, something about that. I learned by getting frustrated and starting to read the rc.d scripts and the okay. supporting that, shell code. That's what I do. And yep. then discovering that parts of the in the interface is documented in man pages. The problem with that is that even at its best, man pages are only reference documentation. Perfect. So if you forgot the order of arguments to a function or the exact order, if, is it is it arcs <laughs> create or create Sorry. arcs? Making me laugh, but, Jim. but it's not good. Uh, tutorial or even white paper material. What we need is a chapter and something like the handbook or even just a wiki page in the FreeBSD wiki. You can point someone at like, here's how you get it up and running. Yes, 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 yes. yes. So let's, 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 let's start in Coimbra. I will find if I, I will check if I can find some like-minded individual or just start hacking on my own because and I'm not such of a kernel coder, and I usually do these things when I have uh, time on a Dev, Dev Summit. So the speak. documentation stuff doesn't require kernel coding? I know, that's why I want to start with that. <laughs> and the other point is to save me some work, because believe it or not, this area is the thing that is most frequently asked and most that people <laughs> most frequently get into trouble with on both the open sense and the TrueNAS forum. But um, at least TrueNAS and I expect open sense has the excuses. They claim that their middleware is in charge of system configuration, yeah. and you're supposed to go through it and not around it. And if you break it, it's open source. You get to own the pieces. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know, so, I configured my TrueNAS with VLANs and bridges problem is that it's... and everything, and it works. It works if you know what you're doing. Like exactly. You, 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 you cannot use the... It works all through the UI. You can do all the advanced networking and TrueNAS in the UI, but you still need to be aware which network layer goes on top of which to keep yes. the previous network stack happy. And that's the problem here, that... The interface, and that's something you can't really fix in user space alone, is so prone to misuse, to accidental misuse. Yeah. It's like uh, having a well-oiled uh, angle grinder handle. <laughs> not, not disagreeing, Jan, but let's, let's just start yeah. documenting this shit, right? From the FreeBSD point of view. And people who are knowledgeable enough will be, will, will as a so, first, be able to abstract from FreeBSD to true NAS. <laughs> so, for example, it would be really nice if we had the option of just taking a physical interface with, or any existing Ethernet-like interface and turning it into a bridge with a single member, basically moving the IP level configuration yes. to the new bridge and having the <laughs> old interface as the first so that it's easy to move just basically that you can convert an existing interface into a bridge containing this interface as first member. Yes, and activate bridge inherit Mac so people don't need to clear their ARP caches and lose connectivity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. Yes, and yes, yes, yes. I just want to point out um, Jan, your comment is, while correct, um, I have many, many, many systems that have bridges which there is no, uh, there's no local host access. It's just a through sure. path to the yeah. VMs. Yeah, sure. uh, what we really should look at as FreeBSD is what OpenBSD did. OpenBSD's bridging driver was even worse and had more tentacles into the system reportedly when the FreeBSD one does. And instead of fixing it, they wrote a new bridging driver, which is intentionally less flexible. They called it virtual Ethernet bridging, VEB. VE. And the 
they finally fixed the design flaw with the m bridge driver that it's both a layer two learning bridge and an IP interface. So what happens is if you add a member port, it ceases being an IP interface. It's only a port on the bridge. The bridge is also only a bridge. It's not an IP interface. If you want to attach a host to the bridge, you do that by using the, the ether, which is basically like half of an e pair. You add it to a bridge, and then this is your host port on the bridge. And this is how it should be done, because it's correctly layered. You, it's not inviting you to abuse it and do it the wrong way, because it looks easier. And because there are less corner cases to watch out for, it's probably also a lot easier to get good SMP throughput because there are less states you have to synchronize and less events to watch out for to synchronize. So for example, that, that does actually sound interesting, right? Like, uh... This is not Just a compatibility breaking thing, right? Like, you know, if, mm -hmm. if you're still using if e pair, uh, sorry, if you're still using if bridge, it will continue to work fine. But <coughs> when you feel like it, you can move to the new device, which which actually makes uh, total sense that OpenBSD did that. And, yes. um, and maybe we should try have... to have something like that too. And there's no reason why this bridging driver couldn't have support for having one child instance per VLAN ID you want to support. And so you cre would ha create a bridge, or not a bridge, let's say a switch. Then you add v uh, VLANs or, uh, to the switch, and then you attach the host interfaces to specific VLANs the host should care about, and can have things like tap interfaces for Beehive attached to it. And maybe someone can come up with a nice fast path for NetMap uh, or something mm. uh, to get it the frames over the bridge in and out of Beehive. But okay. yeah. uh, sorry, I needed a short break. Uh, who asked about the uh, bridge interfaces without IP addresses and strictly layer two connectivity? I brought it up as just, that just, how just the before layering should look like. No, it wasn't you. It was, was somebody else. You mentioned that the, the IP address must go on the bridge, which is perfectly correct. And then somebody asked, uh, mentioned that that he ran uh, bridges without IP addresses at all. Um, that's me. That, that's my, my, that's uh, John D. Okay, yeah. John. So, okay. yeah, bridge, bridges without IP addresses are, of course, perfectly supported. It's, it's all just layer two connectivity, and we, yes. also have, we also have them, lots of them. The yes. point Jan was trying to make, and I'm reinforcing every every other day or so on the, on the respective forums, is that if you have any layer three address on an interface, and you make that interface a member of a bridge, no, don't do that. No. The, the, the address must move to the bridge interface. Yes. Because that, otherwise... That's, that's mentioned in one sentence in the bridge one section one. of the handbook without an explanation why that is the case and that all hell will break loose if you don't. Even so worse, people, in an IPv4 so people network. Don't, so that, that's the part where I say the documentation sucks. Sorry. So we need we really need better documentation on that. Yeah, if, if, the host, if, you, if the host needs layer three connectivity in a in a bridge network, then the IP address must be on the bridge, like an RFC must. And yes. a bridge member must not, like an RFC must not, have a layer three address. Maybe and, and just for the not, next uh... FreeBSD release, we can get, so if the kernel folks agree, the kernel to refuse to add member interfaces with IP addresses. So it's just that you can't add them until you have removed them. Yeah, talk to Christoph about that. <laughs> it, maybe with a sysctl or an interface yeah. flag on the bridge or something to allow that. Yeah, just <clears throat> set an interface flag on the bridge to allow it if you, for some yeah. crazy reason, want to have this foot gun uh, preloaded. Yeah. 
there must there must be some mechanism in place already because if you join a network with an ipv6 address to a bridge that one will get removed automatically the uh, 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 link local address and Isn't the kernel will and the kernel will log that it removed the address because it would cause a link scope, scope violation i thought that was only for link aggregates not for bridges also, also with bridges, I'm pretty sure about that because I see these log messages all the time when my servers come up. Okay. Um, um, so, probably sorry. only for the um, for the link local auto uh, managed. Yeah, analysis. yeah, yeah. Only the link local, of course. But the moment an interface is brought up, if you have IPv6, it gets assigned a link local address. I think the, what the, the kernel system. does is, is removes the auto link local flag yes. from the member interfaces. Yep. Um, Patrick, which actually, doesn't help you with manually assigned addresses. Uh, you said that you're running oh. uh, FreeBSD uh, with bridges and without an IP address. So you're basically running a switch. Are you running that on a physical switch or just on, you know, a, a, a machine with a lot of next? Is there like an actual enterprise level of switch that I can boot FreeBSD on? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm running this. The bridge contains a single physical interface and 200 jails. Oh, and all of the IPs are on the jails. Okay, got it. And all of the IPs are on the jails. And how do you connect to the host? Through another interface That's on another, another VLAN. Okay, got it. Management networks, production networks, stuff like that. We essentially we do hosting in jails. So we have about we just provisioned our one thousandth. Uh, pro server, as we called it a couple of weeks ago. So I have 100 machines, roughly, and 1,000 jails, roughly, in production. Nice. Okay, great. And you're not using a jail because we talked about this, I think. You don't have any jail vendor software, right? It's all your own scripts. We're using IOCage and Amazon. Oh, okay. Should we ever okay. refactor? I will look into what Jailer does, but the mm -hmm. goal is to get rid of any jail managing software completely mm -hmm. and just create etc uh, jail.conf.d files oh, because okay. that will finally be item potent and ansible philosophy and yada, 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 because at the moment we are mm -hmm. calling IOKH commands and that is not always reproducible like it should be, and it's yeah. a pain, so it calls for refactoring. Not, 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 to go too, not to go too off topic about that, because that was supposed to be a jail call topic, but uh, yeah. Dan actually asked about a feature like that, which I na named it, uh, I, I think I named it dash capital D for Dan in jailer, <laughs> which basically mm -hmm. it doesn't even do anything. It just reads in your arguments from the command line and generates an RC conf into the STD out. So you can do whatever you want with it, basically, you know? That's great. Uh, um, yeah. Patrick, okay. my, my, my idea was during development to use Jailer, which is obviously the much more modern and, and robust and uh, orthogonal system compared to IOKH with lots of ad hocery mm -hmm. uh, due to uh, lacking experience by the author. But Brenton is not to blame. I mean, really, IX Systems did everyone a great yeah. service by, by publishing a jail manager that worked in the first place. Yeah. So, uh, and then we were planning to look at what jailer generates, but then work from this and deploy it with Ansible and templates. Got it. So, one of the things I see happening here is we all, when we talk about these things, we're all using a similar language, but slightly different. And um, Patrick, I don't know exactly how your organization talks about it, but you have a you have networks or or VLANs which are VM nets, and then you may have management networks which are for your hypervisors, and you can have VMs on your hypervisor which belong to different VM subnets, not necessarily yes. all of them, possibly multiples of them. Yes, of course. And, just just replace VM with jail and hypervisor with jail host. Yeah, yeah, under, understood. Understood. But, but, but apart from that, it's, it's really the same. And yes, of course, we have jails. We have bridges that represent public networks in a certain VLAN. Bridges yes. a VLAN that is essentially connected via lag to a pair of switches. And we have bridges that are just in the air 
locally on the host and that provide private connections between jails over a second interface that belongs to all the jails. And yes. Stuff. And, Do you and provision private, networks, private networks connected to another Ethernet that connects a couple of hosts so jails can talk behind the scenes privately and, and not over the public internet and stuff like that. Uh, so you yes, you can do everything. Sorry, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm sorry, uh, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm keeping still. <laughs> uh, Patrick, do you provision the VLANs on your switches as well end to end? Or um, is there some kind of overlay networking involved? No, no, switches. It's, this is classical uh, layer two. Okay. We have a pair. We have a pair of uh, Cisco for each rack that can do multi-chassis LACP. We connect each host to both of the switches. Absolutely. Create a lag, then put all the VLANs on top of that lag, and the rest is software and configuration. Patrick, uh, it's you and I do something very, very similar. But by any chance, uh, any of you uses a VXLANs as an overlay network? So you, your customers, jails can talk internally? Because because I I want I want to understand from a uh, user experience perspective. Let's say if your customer has two jails and they want an internal network between the two jails, do you provide that? And if you do, how? Um, I assume they put them on the same VLAN and have Ansible or something else provision the VLAN on all relevant switches in the network which is the old-fashioned way of doing it, just automated. Um, with VXLAN, the advantage is that you have a single source MAC address per server and you don't have to provision anything on the switches. You just have a dumb underlay and have the hypervisors uh, encapsulate and de-encapsulate the packets and some access point to the outside network on potentially some other system where you basically de-encapsulate and route for traffic. Mm -hmm. It's supposedly the modern way. It scales further, but it requires so far VXLAN handling and software. So it has more overhead than VLANs on lag interfaces. So the problem that I've run into with this discussion is the assumption that your jail or your VMs are running on the same hypervisor. And unfortunately, I can't do that. So I may have a jail or a VM on two separate hypervisors, and they want to talk on a private subnet. Exactly so why happens, you would want to, to use something so, like VXLAN. So what we've done is the networking group, we own uh, the, uh, uh, the .254.x VLAN, and the networking team uh, enables that VLAN, and it is marked unroutable for the main network. But we can take that, and then we can assign that, uh, subnet it out, um, and pass uh, traffic across the net to the various people that are part of it. Um, uh, oh, I don't know if that helped. For alias-based jails instead of VNet-enabled jails, what I experimented with in a lab setup, and which worked very well in a lab setup, was to have the jail hosts act as IP routers, have a per host network prefix, and then announce that into the IGP and use layer free routing instead of bridging. Uh, the advantages compared to bridging is that you're Switches don't have to learn all the MAC addresses. They basically have to learn one MAC address per host. And the downside is that now all your staff has to understand routing and dynamic routing at that. I may be mistaken, but this sounds an awful lot like uh, a Kubernetes internal net subnet routing for pods. Um, in this case, I, think, just... I think it's still more transparent than that. We're looking into a similar direction. And what I would want to do is just, as Jan said, use the FreeBSD host as an IP router and mm -hmm. dynamically announce jails IP addresses. But instead of but going, back to, for you. going back to alias-based jails, we definitely want to keep the VNet. 
because of customers of our hosting products are used to having a loopback interface and everything in their jails. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we definitely need that for various services like so, Redis, Elasticsearch, etc. There are so many programs that will course. not work with an alias-based jail. Well, so what I want to do is just move the bridge off the physical and keep it in thin air, map all the jails into the bridge, have the host as a router, and dynamically announce the jails IP addresses via BGP or OSPF. I'm not quite sure yet, BGP probably. Um, I did this before uh, Christoph's rework of the bridge driver when the bridge driver was a big bottleneck because there was a single mutex mm -hmm. per bridge yeah. in the data path. And the reason was that I wanted to have the e pairs uh, as point to point links, put a slash uh, 31 or slash 30 or IPv4 and a slash 127 IPv6 on each e pair yes. in the jail case where the VNet enabled jail would have just its IP address and the router IP address on the link. And then everything is routed beyond that link. And there is no bridge. And your routing policies define what that means. That that would be awesome. We, we did not but... go that way because in IPv4, we would need to waste either waste lots of addresses or uh, use RFC 1980 networks as transfer networks and get all quirky about this thing because unfortunately ePair emulates a broadcast medium so Which you cannot run to. it you cannot run it unnumbered what i would love to see um, jan do you know if this would be feasible i cannot code it but as a network engineer i would love to see a true point to point interface like a serial link or PPP or anything from the host to the jail. So we don't That's need possible. IP addresses. So we don't need IP addresses on these links. We can run them unnumbered and just use a static slash 32 or slash 128 route um, across that interface into the jail. That would be That awesome. already exists inside of NetGraph. Okay. Uh, and can be configured in like 10 lines of shell if you know the right uh, invocation uh, of this. Um, you can have a pure layer free net graph interface. I think it's even called ng uh, for net graph ng e face or something. Yes. And it's a IP interface and you just have an, one hook for IP for E4 and another hook for IPv6 to take the packets off along somewhere into your in your net graph configuration and that works with the jail framework um, yes you can do it using the uh, pre-start and uh, release hooks okay and it also um, works with uh, beehive no it doesn't not that way oh not that way okay beehive require beehive has no non-ethernet like interface it, it uses tap so it needs to be bridged. No, it doesn't just use tap. It also supports uh, net graph sockets, but mm -hmm. it sends Ethernet frames over them because that's what the VIO net uh, mm. is just a right. way to move Ethernet right. frames. As far as I know, there is no standardized IP point to point interface to expose to the guest kernel for which guest operating systems include drivers. And, but what you may be able to do is to put a host address on the interface and use an interface route to a RFC 1980 address for your IPv4 case, where you have an Ethernet interface and use the um, interface route as default route so that you don't have to do the normal interaction. The route doesn't have to be on the same subnet. You just have... the problem is that okay in the case of VNet enabled jails you can handle that, but for um, hypervisors the problem is that it is an uncommon configuration which you can't auto configure via DHCP. But you don't have to for VNet enabled jails. But again, this is supposed to be a Beehive call. Um... 
for Beehive, uh, that's the best you can do is to have two addresses per subnet and use a slash 31 or slash 127. In the IPv6 <coughs> case, there's not much to be gained except for protection from certain resource exhaustion attacks from not using a slash uh, 64 because you will have no problems getting enough global unicast IPv6 address space to have a proper address plan. But for IPv4, yeah, that's um, costly. I mean, I know how we handle in using uh, for Beehive, we actually do full um, VLANs as well. Yeah. But doing it on um, Illumos is very mm -hmm. easy. Yeah. Um, we also have, but, and since they're fully VLAN, there's no concern about any kind of resource exhaustion because you just use <laughs> non, is... non routable networks and, okay, you use the same IPs on each VLAN. Doesn't no. matter. The problem is that there are things like the na neighbor cache in IPv6 where a host, uh, a malicious guest could just rotate through billions of addresses uh, polluting the cache, stuff like this. But if uh, it's a slash hundred twenty seven, there's exactly one valid entry which will get cached and everything else would be discarded. And there's no way an unwanted third device could take over any unallocated address. So it's really just making certain misconfigurations impossible. Being on a, I mean, how, how I don't follow, it, it may be specific to how it's being used, but, you know, if, if you're on a VLAN, something on one VLAN isn't going to affect the other. It does. Indirectly, if you have a Mac to interface cache, your NDP or up cache, and that has a certain maximum capacity. And if someone just sp pollutes that cache, that can have the unintended consequence that, from your point of view as a hoster, that it just uh, flushes useful entries out. Of course, it will get relearned, but still, it's noisy, it's annoying. It's possible to have a customer just guess the next IP address, put it on an interface and have it work until you are you allocate it. Stuff like that. So what, what, what do you mean guess the next IP address? Let's say you allocate a slash 24 IPv4 network, use the first address in the network for the router, the second for the first guest um, beehive or VNet enabled jail. And the customer has control over either the VNet enabled jail or the beehive guest and uh, wants another address and just takes the next one and puts it manually in some configuration file. And if you don't do very tight firewalling, that will work at the beginning until you allocate that address to something else for your API well, for the one properly firewall your shit, but yes. two. Okay, so uh, you know they, they've got an, I, an IP address that is can't be used anywhere else. They, yes, it can't be used but... for anything. So so what? I don't care. They're um, on their own VLAN. I care because uh, maybe I have to provide them with the nice multi-tenancy features they want, and they now have blocked something for themselves, and it only. Br breaks in a visible fashion later. It's better to have it break immediately and never work for some definition of work. So that you can, of course, properly firewall stuff, but why even allow the misconfiguration to be a possible configuration when you can just, from first principles, make it impossible to configure it wrong? Basically, why do you argue, do you need a foot gun?
you can, of course, do it in a way that the impact is limited. They can't attack anything else. Sure, I'm not doubting that. That's just what you're supposed to do. But why give them so much rope? <laughs> Well, even as uh, Andrew described how we're setting up our VLANs here, her, her prominent, um, where you can also define in zone configurations, at least in Solaris for Beehive zones, specific IPs that it can only listen on. And I think solves part of the issue you were just explaining there, them trying to grab the next free IP. If in the zone configuration that the IP isn't allowed, it, it, it the VM can't l latch onto it. Um a uh, new uh, mandatory access control module has just been accepted up into FreeBSD current, which uh, will add a similar kind of ACL, where once the kernel module is loaded, uh, a jail or VNet is, uh, can no longer configure an address not allowed to be configured on it. So it doesn't matter if it's learned via DHCP or manually configured. Uh, there's now an ACL per jail controlling which prefixes are allowed. Once the, it's, the module is called Mac IP ACL. Right. So, I mean, combination, I mean, and, but that solves the issue that you're bringing up, though. Right? That was countering Andrew's argument. So, that that's just my solution for that, personally, is just to set the ACL and zone configs. And of course, that also work. But this is again for the net host network. So if you use Beehive and in a jail, you aren't inspecting the layer two. It's on the system call level for network configuration, so that you can't put the address. Or if you have a, That's a tab interface, the guest can still send an up frame. It's not a in packet inspection. It works at the level of the networks that configuration system calls. That's a good question to ask. Uh, Illumos friends, how does your cross row limit a zone to an IP? Like since you have, since the zone has its own IP stack, if someone did execute, if config the, you know, the zone interface and uh, some random IP or the next IP, uh, how does a uh, crossbow not allow that? Is it like, on, on it's which It's actually layer? not in crossbow. Okay. It's in the zone config. It's at the uh, the zone atom. The, well, um... but zone the zone config and crossbow interact. Um, I think it just refuses to send. I mean, <laughs> excuse me. I think it just refuses to send any of the packets related to it. Although I would have to double check that. Oh, so it's done at some kind of network filtration layer, not. I not... think so. I have to double check that. That's a very good thing to know. So, which 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 firewalls do you guys lose? Oh, you you have your own, right? IPF. Yeah, we well, um, I mean, on the Solaris side, there's IPF, but uh, as an organization, we have um, yes, uh, PF Sense firewalls oh. that we put on all of our as as, an, as edge firewalls for each one of our okay. customers. But 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 yeah, we but, use a, a NAT instead of exposing external IPs directly. Right, but 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 if, if, if when which is still... which is another yeah which is another thing that makes it relevant there since it's all NATed there, we don't have to worry about separating out which customer gets which yeah. IP space. They can all be on the same. Yeah, but 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 from the zone's perspective, when you're uh, in in the zone config. Uh, if you're doing that, so is it like modifying the host firewall? Um, so you generally we attach a VNIC to the mm -hmm. to the zone, and the zones attach either to an Ether sub if it's attached to if it's the internal network. But if yep. it's an external network, we generally attach it to like an aggregate or just a standard port directly. Yep. Um, it's in between that layer but it's connecting the, the zone to that, that it's blocking it. I think that's where it's listening on layer two and dropping anything that's on that IP address that doesn't match the zone configurations file for the IP that's defined for it to listen on. Which is I why think if that's you have... correct. But okay. again, I would have to double check. Okay. Andrinik, uh, think of it as something like geom for ethernet frames instead of block devices. 
Oh, that's very interesting. Very. That's why even in the so you um, have uh, in a zone no types in a and... zone uh, in a zoned beehive. Uh, let's say you have a zone beehive running Windows. The customer can change their IP in Windows, but it just wouldn't work, right? Correct. No, that's... Correct. Yeah. Well, in, in on Solaris Beehive. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, uh, it Windows, will take effect Win in the guest, but the network yeah. will not allow the frame. To Who make passed. it from the virtual machine into the next hop. Okay, got it. I wonder how hard would it be to create something like that on FreeBSD. That is that sounds like an uh, awesome. With IPFW, you can probably do it in uh, a one liner yeah. using a flow table. Oh, got it. Um, you would have an, a flow table and then index on interface, MAC address, and IP address. And just add the allowed ones and have all, yeah, you add the allowed ones and the rest just gets discarded and locked yeah. probably or at least counted. That makes sense. That makes total sense. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we, we would do it on the, uh, you know, on the firewall layer. You probably layer, want yeah. to have a probability of logging. So let's say one in 10,000 gets locked and everyone gets counted. Okay so that the log messages don't spam your system yeah uh, and and, and a, a, a stupid question uh, do zones support dhcp not be not beehive zones but um, you know act, um, what do, native zones do they also support dhcp inside the zone um or you have to set things no because I set everything statically, so Got I've it. never, so I, I don't think about it. Okay. There are different types of zones in OmniOS. Are you talking about uh, Omni, like the the OS, like Solaris type zones, the LX zones, and you said BI, that's some of the ones you're talking about, but LX zones, yes, you can use DHCP, but I'm not entirely sure about like the native zones of the OS. That makes, I don't know what that's called in every system, but yeah, I don't use them very often. Okay. Cause, cause it would be interesting. I've used the, I use it, them a little mm -hmm. bit, but, um, I never use them with DHCP, so... Got it. Because I want to understand that blocking mechanism. Like, is it coded? I mean, I, I mean, you told me you have to check, and I would love to hear hear, hear an answer maybe in two weeks. Like, is it is it like... Uh, it, does it know that all DHCP client requests, because they they go on... What's the default? 255.255.255? Or is it 0000, 000 on the destination port and the source... The source? <laughs> The source IP in DHCP standard. Uh, the MAC address is FFFFF. That's for sure, right? Because it's sending a broadcast to get an IP address. And I'm wondering if like the zones configured in a way that, oh, okay, this um, is a DHCP request. I'm going to allow it. Then this is, it got an IP address. I'm going to allow it. Now you're sending actual data with the, with the IP that you're supposed to. I'm going to allow it. I imagine. Then, yeah, go on. Wait. I, I, I imagine if you were running DHCP on it, a DHCP client, it would have to be unrestricted, I would think. Okay. Um, okay. So DHCP, this crossbow, go ahead. I, I, the DHCP sorry. request uh, wouldn't be sent from the uh, broadcast MAC address, but to the broadcast, Ooh, a broadcast MAC, address. MAC address. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and then you get a answer to the broadcast IP address address to your MAC address. Yes. Okay, that's at least good. yeah. That's how you can do it. Uh, if you don't want to broadcast the answer, you can oftentimes configure DHCP servers to broadcast via answers. But do you really want? Uh... Okay, got it. I think I need to fire up my uh, OmniOS and check that out. That would be very interesting to see. Uh, so, so that's called a restricted mode in 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 in, in Lumos. So you where you're restricting the IP that can be in beehived zone. Sorry, zone to beehive <laughs> and in, in, in any other type of zone. I don't remember what the documentation specifically calls it. Um there are but there are flags for it in the zone config file. Okay. Yeah, so in, in OmniOS, I put a, a reference to how you had set it up in zone config on OmniOS, and then I also just put another link to the white paper on crossbow. And the crossbow has some pretty good diagrams that might explain how it's doing what it's doing with the the networking. And that might give you a better understanding of how it's preventing the the the, the uh, 
IP address from communicating out of the VM. Yeah. Got it. Do you have any further documentation you can link to other than the white paper you already linked to from Usenix? Um, that was the one I, I'm by that gives me most of my what I do with Crossbow. Um, I have not really looked for other documentation. I'm sure it's out there for it. Um, um, Andronik, maybe relevant to your use case with Beehive. Um, if you use uh, PCI Express pass through of virtual functions, you can disable um, the for the virtual functions. Um, overriding the MAC address so that they're restricted to just the MAC address you configure. And if you want to have the least overhead on the CPU, you could then use, even if it's ugly, MAC-based VLANs in your switches to use this for isolation. And then you can have just uh, your Beehive guest getting access to a PCI virtual function and the switch knows that the MAC address you assign to this virtual function in, in the FreeBSD case, the um, configuration file for IOVCTL is assigned to this VLAN only. If you want, have a one-to-one -one correspondence between MAC address and uh, VLAN, you can do that. And that way you would have almost no overhead on the host. And I assume Switches offering Mac-based VLANs can also do that at line rate in hardware. Uh, so so uh, if I want to do VLAN on, you said, the virtual functions, wh wh where would I configure the VLAN on the host? Uh, you would just assign, uh, make sure that the virtual function can't spoof its MAC address to the network. Okay. Via the IOV CTL file. Yep. And uh, there should be a setting for that. And then you configure your switch ports to uh, do Mac based v VLAN. Got Mac based it. VLAN assignment. Yeah. Uh, as long as each Mac address and virtual functions corresponds to exactly one VLAN. Yeah. You can have multiple Mac addresses in the same VLAN, but not the other way around. Uh, doing this, and then you wouldn't have to do any kind of packet. Of inspection, forwarding, filtering in software. Mm -hmm. I would have the most CPU cycles available for useful work. Uh, but that's just a special case if you have, can have uh, something like the Nick we talked about last week. Yeah. yeah. By the way, the lab loved the concept of virtual functions. They're like, oh my God, if config and I have 45 interfaces. <laughs> uh, you can have up to 64, I think, or 63. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's 60, 65, one for the host no. and 64. Oh, yeah, okay. Yep. What, the physical and 64 virtual. So that can, yes. And... and I have two of that, Nick. So <laughs> I, have, I can have 120, 130, 130 yeah. interfaces on the host. Yes. And you can pass through the virtual ones to the Beehive guests? Yes. Directly, uh, but you can also uh, do other kinds of, yeah. But in this case, you really would have to do Mac based D learning because uh, you have only a single switch port, uh, every all the traffic goes through, unless you mm -hmm. and with password, you are not in a position to, unless FreeBSD, unbeknownst to me, has support for doing the encapsulation somewhere else in hardware. And, and yeah. I, 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 I did want to ask about that. So uh, 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 the Beehive, both on, well, I think on Crossbow is different. Uh, Beehive, uh, I can't technically pass like EM0 to Beehive, right? Everyone is using a bridge well, in that situation. You can by using DevCTL to detach the Intel network card driver from your gigabit Ethernet interface at runtime, or you can statically mask it in loader conf so that okay. the driver never attaches. Okay. And then you have uh, uh, attach the uh, pass-through placeholder driver, and that driver can then be passed through to um, Beehive. Okay, and the virtual functions can also use the pass-through. Okay, got it. 
Yes, they are designed to be used with pass through, but they can also be used for VNet enabled jails. Okay. Like we did the uh, last time. Okay. Sounds yes. great. Sounds great. Uh, somehow the conversation that John D suggested about dynamic networking, we got into here. So, uh, well, inev thought... inevitably, whenever networking comes up, it ends up, <laughs> it ends up going all over the place specifically because I mean, it's it's one of those topics where it's definitely something that ties into Beehive, mm -hmm. but it ends up being um, host OS specific. So the way yeah. you guys on BSD handle things, the way we handle things on Illumos end up being very different. And it really, the topic where you, going forward, you want something like a smart mix slash DPU uh, with proper driver integration to your host operating system so that you can use the combination of ASIC and firmware to expose enough virtual functions of the right kind to your host instead of having to do it all on the main CPUs. And to be frank, at the jail calls, we all envy your crossbow. Just, just FYI. Crossbow, I love crossbow. Yeah, That's one of the things here. which can only happen if you have someone in a position to throw people at refactoring work and force them to keep at it. Or you have some microsystems budget. That's, I think, what he was implying. Yeah, you need a company or big research grant or something. The only, in FreeBSD, the only way it would happen is if someone dedicates a million or two to it through the FreeBSD Foundation and tells them, here, and, is, and as much here's as enough I... money to hire four or five developers for two year, a year or two, uh, probably more like two years. Uh, please do this. And as much as I love the results in that case, too many projects like that is why Sun is no longer a company. Although there were definitely more frivolous ones. Yeah. Anyway, we've been going for almost an hour and a half, and Alejandro it's one thirty. A question. Well, okay. Maybe um, we can give him a few minutes. For those who don't join the jail talks, uh, we usually go for like you know, three and a half hours. So no, um, <laughs> not usually. Okay, three hours. Sure. Um, is our max. I'm, I'm all for now, folks. Uh, goodbye. Thanks for the talk. Thank uh, you, Patrick. Um, I hope I see at least some of you in Coimbra and uh, in a couple of, a couple more uh, Beehive and Jail talks in between. In the meantime, I mean, so uh, see Have you. Have a good one. Have a good night or good day wherever you are located. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alejandro, should we go into your uh, question? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, have at it. Um, so basically, um, we've basically the nail in the head. It's right over here with the Linux Grub. So we, I've been having this issue for a few weeks. And the only way to fix it was uh, by configure, uh, configuring the grub on the Ubuntu guest to rather, instead of telling the grub to use certain clock source, uh, I, was, I was able to solve it just by telling it that TSC is unstable. So using clock source TSC was making that the guest unstable um, and I was randomly at some point I was unable to SSH into the guest or ping it or do anything and I just had to shut it down so um, the way I use Beehive or, or the way that I virtualize my guest is via Trunas and it's Beehive and so basically that the issue is solved now uh, but my question is more regarding uh, the clock sources when it comes to beehive 
virtualization. So when you when I spin up a, a FreeBSD guest on TrueNAS, I I my guest defaults to TSC. My TrueNAS host also uses TSC, which is the highest value for I forgot the the exact command was was like sys cdl current dot time counter dot choice and from there you get the choices and their their quality and so tsc is the highest one so it makes sense that they default to tsc but if i virtualize a freebsd guest using vmware on my mac os machine the freebsd guest does not default to TSC, it defaults to HPET. And so my question is, sorry, I've been rambling over the question, but so the question is why the host on TrueNAS defaults to TSC when in VMware it defaults to HPET? Uh, it, I, I can answer host? that. Okay. And by the host, you mean the VM, right? Yeah, correct. Yes. So, so the, the host, the, when I when I say the host, I say that like the either the TrueNAS or my my Mac computer, and the guest will be the virtualized guest. The VM. So, is uh, your TrueNAS running on bare metal, or is it, are you relying on nested virtualization? M my TrueNAS is running on bare metal. Load. There, it will use uh, the TSC if the uh, TSC is supposed to have a fixed frequency because that's the lowest overhead to read because the TSC is just a machine-specific register which can be read using yep. the read TSC instruction, yep. which is a lot faster than even reading the uh, HPAD or uh, CPI timers in the chipset. So... That's the reason why the FreeBSD kernel prefers to use the TSC on AMD64 unless you have early 64-bit server hardware where the TSC wasn't synchronized or didn't run at a fixed frequency. Uh, yeah. And, and to so, answer your specific question, which was why is a FreeBSD guest choosing a different uh timer or clocker depending uh your depending on the host right that was your question right why is it choosing uh this it, cl clock in uh, beehive and the other clock in uh esxi so sorry sorry to interrupt but, so the yep. question is more based on the hypervisor yes because if i use vmware to virtualize freebsd yes and my guests uses HPET. Yes. But if I use VHive, on the other hand, my guess gets uh, defaults to TSC. Yes. So the short answer to that is it's actually hard-coded. Uh, for example, we just changed that, I think, like a month or six weeks ago, that if you're running on ARM, and ARM has its own uh, clocking thing. It used to run on a different clock, which would do polling very often. And your on your on your Apple Silicon, it would display hundred percent CPU while the guest was actually completely idle. While FreeBSD was completely idle. So we I we dug into the code and I, I, I had a look and I think I think Mark Johnson changed the uh, he did the commit, which apparently it's hard coded. It can actually check what the host is and based on that it can actually and it, it, there are obviously a lot of variables so you know there's like the platform uh, architecture there is what uh, what machine is it running on so it can know if it's running on Chemio, it can know if it's running on um, uh, vmware uh, and in this case also if it's running on uh, apple silicon Chemio. and based on that we have a lot of hard-coded values no it's not hard coded. There's just a default algorithm used to find the best. Yes. According to the cost function, but you can override the choice. 
via no, but, 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 by, but, but by hard coded i mean you know it's, it's, it's coded inside the uh, system that uh, okay uh, this is the best option to choose no there is a there is a cost assigned and mm -hmm. if you don't you can override the choice by just assigning the ctl at runtime you I don't, i'm not sure if it's possible at one but it's at the very least at load time you can pick a yes. different uh, time counter and i think even uh you can change your time counter and the event timer used at runtime using sysctl if you're a super user on the host yes but the reason why in on different hypervisors the guests pick different default clocks is that the hypervisors report different virtual or report different timers available so they lie they, differently they don't lie they support different things it's not really a lie at that point uh the lie is something like reporting having hardware support to report a different tsc tick rate with a fractional divider so that you can have your guest live migrate to a faster cpu and still tick at the same rate. That's hardware assisted lying, but uh, just reporting a TSC to the guest has the advantage that the guest can read the TSC in at least on modern hardware without taking a VM access uh, exit by default to support this. And this really saves a lot of CPU cycles otherwise wasted in context switches by letting the guest read the virtualized TSC register. But if your hypervisor doesn't support this, then you have to use some kind of power virtualized clock to get a high clock uh, fidelity. Well, uh, there may be some special page which gets updated at least a thousand times a second where there's a timer to read. And the guest kernel just has to know to read this timer value which will get updated by the hypervisor so, that so the only thing i found good. the only thing that i found in regards to timing in regards to beehive and what you can configure on the, at the command line level is the u flag that's just basically having the the time report in utc time to the vm or guest yeah um, that's... that's the only flag that i'm really seeing that you can easily as an end user configure but as as a developer i i don't know about the codes so i wouldn't i wouldn't know where to look for that right and also on on that topic i've been reading a few uh, few articles and forum posts about the different time counters and apparently hpet is the way to go if you if your host has multiple cores and CPUs rather than TSC. Uh, so the question yes. is, is if, if that is correct, which I'm not sure about, um, shouldn't Beehive be looking at those, like uh, the host number of cores and CPUs, and from there make a decision based on that for uh, a different time counter than TSC? So far, I've been using TSC on all of my guests. Um, and the only ones that I've been having this issue with is with my Ubuntu guests. Um, so um, doesn't matter which, which uh, version of Ubuntu, uh, 20, 22, 18, they all had this, this same issue. So if you installed Debian and compared it to boot, uh, grub, it's grub configurations. Uh, what are the major? Do you have you have you compared to the grub configs to see if maybe one's booting with no uh, with TSC and the other one's not? And that may be the. I mean, Debian's the the parent. I would assume that if it was an Ubuntu, it might regress into from Debian. So I would test that too. Sure, that's on the back burner, but I'll I'll, I'll do I'll, I'll test that on Debian too. Because I mean, it could just be that. Could be just that the default value in, in Ubuntu has a different, you know, grub configuration parameter, and you just need to remove that parameter. Right, but the grub is in. I, I, I'm not sure whether the grub, like the default grubs, uh, has has any config related to 
time counters. I think it's actually the, the virtualizer so, or that sets the time counter. And then you, you can go to the grab to change those settings. Um, according to my understanding, um, Beehive reports a usable as time counter TSC to the gas. And if the host timers are set up correctly, the Beehive timer will also work correctly. What could be the problem is that on your hardware, the TSC is reporting incorrectly as being frequency invariant uh, and not having and not drifting apart and so on. Then if it does, if it's SMP adjusted and so on, then yeah, you can use it. So on the physical system, you would see like I'm putting it here that the this SMP TSC means that the TSC registers on different cores are kept synchronized by the hardware so that you don't see drift across cores over time. But all, let's say they are all drifting in step with the single clock source feeding them all. And if the TSC uh, is frequency invariant as reported by this, this CTL, uh, then it's usable as a and gets used. Otherwise, uh, the TSC detection will say, oh, you have a TSC, but it's running, for example, in early uh, AMD 64 systems. If you still had an original Opteron 64 or something, it would speed up and down to save power. And the TSC would just tick at one tick per clock cycle. And if you lower the frequency, the TSC would take slower. Uh, yeah. This was a problem in early hardware, but now hardware, correctly working hardware no longer does this and reports that it doesn't do this. And FreeBSD trusts this if the hardware reports it and uses the efficient time counter. But if your um, hardware either doesn't have a usable TSC and reports it as usable, then your hardware would break the assumptions that the software is written upon and you would see this kind of breakage probably. So try to use a different time counter on the host. The next best. Reboot Just some, like, if the problem Kern. goes away. So you're saying something like Herm, that time counter at hardware in FreeBSD? That's what you're talking yeah. about? So, um, yes. I think it is it. Let me check. I hadn't I... have to mess with this in ages. Uh... Yeah, it's uh, change this to the next best choice. So. Put an issue where someone was talking about exactly that. So but I... try something like ACPI fast or HPAD and see if the problem goes away. If it does, your hardware's TSC uh, isn't usable and shouldn't have been used and didn't report that it isn't unusable. So there was maybe some bug in your BIOS or other stuff. And yeah, I don't know how old your host hardware is for your Brunner's box. It's not, it's not very old. Other but yeah, that's interesting. New, is it a big little system? Something like Alder Lake or Raptor Lake. Maybe there's some bug around big little systems on uh, AMD 64. I don't know exactly. I'll have to get into the details, but I bought, I bought the system from uh, actually from from Trunas. Uh, they should know a thing or two about like, what like, they're selling. Like three, four years ago, max. Okay, if it's three years ago, Intel didn't have anything of the sort yet. 
all the latest so 12th generation core CPUs are the first ones to have uh, efficiency cores in addition to the performance cores. So if you're on ninth or 10th generation or something, uh, this doesn't apply, but I would still try picking another time counter and see if a problem goes away. Sounds good, will do, thanks. Start with HPT and if that doesn't work, try ACPI fast as well. Don't try the I8254 uh, timer, that's, so that's just too slow and inefficiently accessed. Basically, it goes through a multi a multiplexed uh, ISA port, so the low pin count. It's somewhere in your super IO emulation chip, probably. So you really don't want to do that. Uh, Fair enough. Thank you. And the other thing you can do is inside your guests, configure them not to use the uh, uh, TSC reported by Beehive, but I would prefer a solution outside of the guests because otherwise you have to change every guest instead of having to change the host once. Exactly. So, yeah. Because I definitely have production virtual machines with multiple cores, which do not suffer from this problem in Beehive. So it's not inherently broken in Beehive. And John probably can speak to it as well. Agreed. Or cool. Beehive guests, which do not hang up with timer problems. And if it's only one guest, it could also just be a bug in the guest that it's just this specific version of this specific guest distribution has an issue and yeah. If the issue is only encountered under FreeBSD Beehive, that gets annoying because then you get to play the blame game. Folks, I apologize. I have another meeting I need to prep for in 15 minutes. I'm gonna need to drop off. It, as always, it was fun. Um, appreciate See. everybody's input. Thank you, John. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else has any thoughts? Alejandro, Jan? Not really. Uh... No. Okay, that sounds perfect. Um, should we uh, close? Yes, it's almost two hours. Okay, sounds perfect. Uh, well, thank you to everyone who participated. Uh, I'll, to whoever's watching on YouTube, thank you for watching. Like and subscribe so you don't miss out on our future uh, meetings.